end of May 1945. The war in Europe is formally over, but the war in the hearts of men and women is not over. Across the continent, the anger and hatred that ignited this war is still glowing like singeing embers in the hearts of millions. Nowhere is this clearer than in Yugoslavia, where even the actual war, mass murders, and terror seems to never want to end. This is episode 134 of War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. It's been a while since we paid a visit to Yugoslavia in this series. Before we dive in again, I'll recap a couple of things I spoke about last time that set the scene for today's episode. If you want the full detail of the situation immediately before this episode begins, I suggest you go back and watch the episode number 113 from September last year. As I covered in that video, in June 1944, the British brokered an agreement between the Yugoslav government in exile led by Prime Minister Ivan Subasic and loyal to King Peter II and Josef Tito's partisan movement, the National Committee of the Liberation of Yugoslavia, the NKOJ. Under the VIS agreement, named for the Adriatic island which hosts Tito's British protected headquarters, Tito promised not to try and change the Yugoslav constitution until after the war. The two sides also agree to form a coalition government. The question of the monarchy was essentially left to be dealt with later. The agreement was the political death knell for Chetnik leader Draza Mihailovic and his Chetniks. Mihailovic collaborated off and on with the Axis, also the British hope that by courting Tito they will retain some influence in post-war Yugoslavia. Mihailovic was stripped of his position as chief of staff of the Yugoslav army and the partisans were recognized as the armed forces of Yugoslavia. We left the story with the agreement signed. Tito was planning his invasion of Serbia, not so much to liberate it from Axis rule, but to take control from the Chetniks. On September 1st, 1944, Mihailovic orders a last ditch general uprising to seize the country from the Germans and prevent it falling into partisan hands. Mihailovic does manage to call up thousands of new fighters, but the uprising is doomed from the start. He has nowhere near enough arms, and Tito has offered an amnesty to all Chetniks and collaborators provided they sign up with the partisans by mid-September. The fate of the uprising is sealed on September 12th when King Peter makes a broadcast on the BBC calling all Serbs, Croats and Slovenes to join the National Liberation Army under the leadership of Marshal Tito. Soon, partisan forces have conquered much of Serbia and Macedonia, but Mihailovic escapes capture at his headquarters at Pranjani. Faced with complete military and political defeat, he seeks salvation from an unlikely quarter, the Soviet Union. On September 10th, he sends emissaries across the Danube to the Soviet headquarters in Craiova, Romania, where they request Soviet mediation with the partisans. Unfortunately, their next set of orders are to go to Bucharest and contact the British and American military missions. Upon learning of this, the Soviets arrest the Chetnik representatives as Western spies, fly them to Moscow and throw them in prison. The Chetniks are forced out of Serbia and into the Sanjak region of Montenegro. Mihailovic is convinced that the Western Allies will at some point land on the Dalmatian or Montenegrin coast to kick out the Germans and secure the Balkans against Tito and the Soviet Union. For this, he offers them 50,000 armed Chetniks. Mihailovic isn't crazy to pin his hopes on this landing. Tito certainly thinks it might happen. So too do the Germans. Remember, Churchill has long seen the Balkans as another soft underbelly of Axis Europe, just like Italy. On top of that, deception operations for D-Day had deliberately encouraged the idea of a Balkan landing, and as we shall see, the relationship between Churchill and Tito publicly declines over the autumn of 44 as Tito draws closer and closer to the Soviet Union. Tito still fears that at some point the Western Allies and the Chetniks will turn against him. So he looks to Stalin for help. On September 18th, he flies from Fiz to Romania and then on to Moscow for his first ever face-to-face -face meeting with the Soviet dictator. The two men agree that Soviet troops will pass through Yugoslavia to pursue retreating German troops. 
Crucially, this will act as a de facto block against Mihailovich's hopes for Western landings in Yugoslavia. Stalin also agrees to provide arms to equip a dozen divisions of the partisan army. This trip is kept secret from the British, and they spend several days searching for the partisan leader while Tito's men make vague excuses as to their chief's whereabouts. When Soviet forces do enter Serbia, Tito's attitude becomes even more openly pro-Soviet and explicitly anti-British and American. He starts restricting the movement of the Western Allied military missions, preventing them from straying too far from partisan headquarters. Tito may have made his bed with the Soviet Union, but already cracks are beginning to show in the relationship. The partisans soon find that the Red Army doesn't quite match up with their vaunted expectations. Captain Basil Irwin of the British SOE recalls witnessing some early tension. They treated the partisans like dirt. Partisan officers, wherever they could, had got uniforms and jackets made and put on some gold stripes or something for rank, and it was a shock to the partisans who thought here was the welcome they were giving to their brother Slavs and the great Russian army and so on to be really treated like dirt by them. Still, the partisans and the Red Army fight side by side to liberate Belgrade. Indy covered the fighting back in his series at the time, and the city is taken on October 20th. After that victory, Soviet forces engage in a rampage of looting, rape, and violence. 1,200 rapes are recorded by the end of 1944, and the real number is almost certainly much, much higher. Milvan Dijlas of the Partisan Military Mission in Moscow writes of his illusions about the Red Army and consequently the communists themselves being destroyed. I covered that whole episode along with the issues of sexual violence by the European Allied and Axis forces in a recent War Against Humanity special, which you should watch for a more detailed examination of such things. Across the border, the liberation of Belgrade is followed shortly by the liberation of the Albanian capital Tirana. Albania, of course, was not part of the pre-war Yugoslavia, but the histories of the two countries are entwined. Here, Enver Hoxha's national liberation movement has assumed the role of a provisional government of Albania, with Hoxha as prime minister and chief of staff of the army. Hoxha promises democracy and free elections, but as we shall see, these are proved mostly hollow. By the end of October, the partisans have cleared most of the south of the country and Hoxha sends his forces to assault the capital Tirana. The fighting is fierce, but Hoxha's forces are supported by the Allied Balkan Air Force and take the city on November 17th. The remaining German defenders retreat to Škoda, close to the border with Montenegro. On November 28th, Hoxha and his LNC commanders arrive in Tirana in triumph. A drop of British Halifax bombers drops congratulatory leaflets and food supplies. The Germans remain in Albania for another two weeks or so, but by November 20th it's clear that the presence is untenable. German troops pull out, heading northeast to Sarajevo in Bosnia, assisted by Albanian nationalists. With Belgrade liberated, Tito turns his attention to securing his position in Yugoslavia. In this, he is aided by Churchill and Eden's abandonment of King Peter. They believe that despite their doubts about Tito, the tito subacic agreement is the only way to maintain some influence in Yugoslavia. In November, Tito, Subacic, and the representatives from the British and Soviet missions set to work finalizing the details of the coalition arrangement. King Peter is to remain abroad, and three regents are to be appointed until a referendum on the monarchy is held after the war. King Peter is understandably furious, seeing this as an effective abdication. On January 11th, he makes a statement formally rejecting the regency. Churchill and Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden have tried reasoning with the king. They have explained to him that there has effectively been a revolution in Yugoslavia. Agreeing to a plebiscite is the only way to keep the principle of the monarchy alive. Now they take a harder line, as Churchill explains in a memo to Stalin. I now suggest that we make the Tito Subacic agreement valid and simply bypass King Peter II. This means that we favor the idea of recognizing the government of Marshal Tito, set up under the regency of the Royal Yugoslav government, and sending an ambassador to Belgrade and receiving one here. In 
March 1945, the Tito Subasic coalition government takes power in Belgrade with Tito as prime minister and Subasic as foreign minister. The Western Allies dispatch ambassadors as promised. Of course, this is just a temporary arrangement, and elections are set for a constituent assembly in November 1945. But already there are signs of the direction of travel. Of the 28 cabinet ministers, 21 are affiliated to Tito's People's Front. The Provisional Assembly is similarly weighted towards the Communists. Of the 318 members, just 80 are non-Communists. In April, Tito's government signs a Treaty of Friendship with the Soviet Union. We have to wait a little longer to see Tito's government in action, but over the border there is a clear demonstration of what happens when revolutionary Communists take power. By January 1945, all German troops are out of Albania and Hoxha launches a campaign against political enemies. In fact, the First People's Tribunal took place already back in December at the Savoia Cinema in Tirana, overseen by Kochi Tsotsu. At first, the show trials and executions are directed against genuine war criminals and maintain at least some degree of legal due process according to British observers. But gradually, Hoxha broadens the scope of his trials, and the pursuit of war criminals becomes cover for a general purge of opposition. In practice, that means anyone who opposes Hoxha's fusion of Stalinism and Albanian nationalism. Hoxha begins by attacking the Catholic Church. Beginning in 1945, he closes down Catholic schools, associations, and newspapers. Churches and chapels are closed or destroyed, as are seminaries and orphanages. Bishops are imprisoned, executed, or sentenced to forced labor. Others flee the country. The party's historians write the Catholic Church out of the story of Albanian nationalism. Behind the front lines in Yugoslavia, Tito decides to wipe out once and for all the remaining Chetnik. Mihailovic has marshaled his forces together in northern Bosnia in preparation for a guerrilla war against the communists. From there, he and a force of a few thousand men set out on a long march through Herzegovina towards Serbia. All through this journey, they are harassed by the partisans and suffer casualties to desertion and disease. On May 10th comes the final battle. The partisans manage to ambush the Chetniks as they cross the Yetsiritsa River. Trapped by the steep-sided river gorge, the Chetniks are exposed to partisan air power and artillery. The battle is a foregone conclusion, and within a couple of days the Chetniks are destroyed along with most of their weapons and their archives. Mihailovic himself manages to escape with a small group and is protected in the mountains by sympathetic villagers. The partisans go on the hunt. They're determined to put Mihailovic on trial. They will finally capture him in March 1946, along with some of his commanders. While the partisans destroy Mihailovic's Chetniks, Ante Pavlic's Croatian independent state is also meeting its end. By the spring of 1945, the Axis presence in Yugoslavia is limited to a bulge of territory jutting out between Austria with a line running th roughly through Ljubljana, Zagreb, and Sarajevo, through the Sirmian front on the border between the independent state of Croatia and Serbia. Trapped in this shrinking bubble, the remains of Ante Pavlic's independent state try to appeal for Western protection as an anti-communist bulwark against Tito and Stalin. In Zagreb, the Ustasha begins squeezing the population of Zagreb for the final defense against the partisans. They lower the conscription age to 17 and draw on 400,000 or so refugees in Zagreb. The bulk of the Red Army has exited Yugoslavia and pushed into Hungary, so it's left to the partisans, now officially the Yugoslav army, to assault the Sirmian front. Through the German and Axis lines on April 12th, capturing the cities of Vikovar, Vinkovic and Supanja, pushing towards Zagreb. A last-ditch attempt to reach an agreement with the Western Allies fails on May 5th. With Zagreb set to fall, Pavlic orders his army to withdraw through Slovenia and Austria and to surrender to the British. He flees the city with a small entourage the next day. Pavlic's Croatians are just part of a mass movement of Axis forces heading north. There's Alexander Lerz, German Army Group E, a group of Chetniks, Serbians and Montenegrin, and Slovenian collaborators, two SS Cossack divisions, and plenty of civilians. The 
Partisans are desperate to prevent their enemies from escaping, and they send three divisions to pursue the columns and cut off the border. The Axis race to escape vengeance is on. The Croatian SKPs head for Bleiburg in Austria after passing through Ravne na Koroskim and Poljana. There they attempt to surrender to the British. Now, I must tell you that at this point, the exact details of the story become difficult to follow and there will still be passionate scholarly discussion on the subject well into the 21st century. In the post-war narratives, sympathetic to Pavlic, the Ustasha and Croatian nationalism, it will be claimed that the entire mass of the Croatian armed forces, about 200,000 people, made it over the border to Austria and surrendered to the British. They were then betrayed and handed back to the partisans for execution. There is an element of truth in this view, but these columns of Croatian and Axis forces are up to 45 or even 65 kilometers long. The reality is that only the leading elements of the columns, about 30,000 people at most, actually make it to Bleiburg, as Indy covered in his episodes. Of this leading element, on May 15th, two Croatian generals meet the British commander, Brigadier Thomas Scott, and a partisan representative at Bleiburg Castle. The British commander says that the Croatians must surrender to the partisans. The partisans give a deadline of one hour to the Croatians, surrender or be destroyed. They give assurances in the presence of the British that they will treat the prisoners in accordance with the rules of war. Faced with a hopeless situation, the Croatian forces in and around Bleiburg and the remaining 170,000 or so still in Yugoslavia surrender to the partisans. This process takes several days to complete, with the Yugoslavs forming the prisoners into columns and marching them away. In view of the British troops in Austria, the partisans treat their captives fairly well. But on the other side of the border, the prisoners, both military and civilian, are deprived of food and water, robbed of valuables, and subjected to random beatings and executions. For many of the prisoners, the final destination of this long march is the town of Maribor. Here they meet their bloody fate. Over the course of several days, tens of thousands of people are executed and dumped in anti-tank ditches. There are dozens of other sites of mass execution across Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, and Serbia. Estimates are that somewhere in the region of 50,000 to 60,000 Croatian and Bosnian collaborationists are executed. Again, these numbers are only estimates, and they are revised up or down depending on who tells the story. Croatian narratives give far higher figures, while narratives sympathetic to the partisans give far lower numbers. Elsewhere, somewhere in the region of 30,000 Slovene and Serbian collaborators have escaped Slovenia further east and surrendered to the British at Ferlach in Austria. Held at a camp in Vitring, about 20,000 of these people are handed over to the Yugoslav by the British under the pretense of transfer to POW camps in Italy. The partisans then murder most of these returnees. The bodies of some eight to 9,000 are dumped in an abyss in Kususki Rog. These Axis forces join other victims of Tito's security services, the Department for Protection of the People, or the OSNA, who hunt down anti-communist and alleged collaborators in the liberated regions of Yugoslavia. Among them are the ethnic Germans in the northern Banat region. Those who didn't evacuate with the German forces now face having their property seized, being expelled from the country, imprisoned, or even executed. We will get back to all of these ethnic cleansings of German minorities in a future episode. One man who doesn't share in this grisly fate is Ante Pavlic, who escapes the massacres by abandoning his foot soldiers. On May 18th, he arrives in the American occupation zone in Austria, meeting his wife and daughters near Radstadt. In mid-June, as the British and Americans begin searching for and extraditing war criminals to Yugoslavia, Pavlic goes into hiding in the village of Tiefbrunau near Salzburg. Assisted by sympathizers, he continues moving around Austria until April 1946, when he flees to Italy in disguise and is given shelter by the Vatican. The Yugoslavs will campaign for his extradition, but Pavlic will travel on a false passport to Argentina in the autumn of 1948, where he joins up with former Ustasha members. Back in Yugoslavia, as summer 1945 comes around, elections for the Constitutional Assembly are on the horizon in November. 
the communist and associated candidates are organized into the People's Front, which welcomes anyone willing to collaborate with the new regime. There is no real opposition to speak of. Some opposition leaders do return from exile, but they find it impossible to run a campaign. The People's Front are backed by the army and OSNA and controls most of the media. It uses the existing network of partisan administration to mobilize its votes. For their part, the opposition are divided by infighting. Subasic himself resigns as foreign minister and then fails to put together an opposition coalition. In the end, the opposition decide to boycott the elections. As a result, Tito's People's Front runs essentially unopposed and they sweep to power with over 90% of the vote. Soon they abolish the monarchy and declare the establishment of the Federative People's Republic of Yugoslavia. A new constitution inspired by Stalin's 1936 Constitution of the USSR is introduced next year, 1946. Like the USSR, it is a union forged by the sword. It welds together a people that has just recently mass-murdered each other in the name of their imagined heritage of domination and dystopian fantasies of ethnically pure nations. One extreme has replaced the other in a sequence of violence that leaves unresolved the frictions of identitarian state-building that gave birth to the modern European nation-states after World War I. An unresolved conflict that will soon flare up again and goes on to this day in 2024. Like Stalin's Soviet Union, it may look like it's the work of one man, Josef Tito. He will want us to think so, and his followers will worship him like the sole father of this unholy system of unity by oppression. Like with all autocratic and totalitarian leaders, this is a lie. These men did not create these unions. These men were not the flame that new nations were forged in. These men were neither the beginning nor the end of a terrible story of strife, suffering, and death. They were nothing more than figureheads for the fearful hatred in the hearts of millions who embraced extremism to get what they wanted, a place of suffering for their perceived enemies. But when you idolize a leader who validates your anger and hatred and promises you retribution, it is not a place of suffering for your perceived enemies that you will get. You'll get suffering for everyone. For these leaders are no leaders. They are conmen who are just mirroring your ire. Anger breeds anger, violence breeds violence, and choosing autocrats to represent you sets you on a journey to a land of misery where anger and violence can grow unfettered. Sooner or later, that terror will be yours to suffer. Never forget. Thank you.